All right. So today, this audio and video podcast, we're going to be talking about simulation and visualization in transportation. And one of the reasons for this is kind of a public service announcement to those that aren't as familiar with this industry as we are. And what I mean by that is just the difference in semantics as far as what 3D visualization is. Wayne, you know, you've been working in this industry a long time, longer than I have. What are some of the names that your clients or others that you've talked to have called visualization? Oh, yeah, yeah. They call it simulation all the time. Um, sim- yeah, simulation, photo. <laughs> one of the old names is photo montage. That's kind of a weird one. But, um, but yeah, when they say simulation, I usually try to correct them and say, no, what we, were, what we do is more of a visual simulation uh, or, or, uh, uh, visual visualization. Yeah. I've even heard things like virtualization or visual simulation, you know, and I guess visual visual simulation probably could be technically correct, but simulation is just a whole different field that involves a lot more algorithms and mathematics where ours is more the visual side of, uh, of the software. So we're going to walk through this. I have some slides here today. Uh, the background will be, we're going to discuss the, uh, we're going to st- discuss our backgrounds. We'll talk about some basic workflows between visualization and simulation to kind of highlight the difference. I'll talk through some examples. I'll talk about simulation in visualization and kind of where that might be headed, how we can push our visualization closer to simulation. And ultimately that's, the point of this whole thing is how the fields are merging and we're trying at civil effects to do our best to push our visualization towards simulation and those in the simulation field, it seems like they're trying to push towards visualization as, as well. And perhaps in the future, they may, there may be some sort of convergence where visualization and simulation are happening at the same time in the same platforms. Then we'll do some case studies. That's where Wayne will take over. And that's kind of the most exciting thing is just some of the things that we've been working on in this field. And then we'll talk about, future possibilities. So I'm Sam, I uh, have a degree in civil engineering from UNLV, started at Nevada Department of Transportation, worked at um, Kimberly Horn, and started civil effects in 2014. Uh, I've been working, trying to work and grow civil effects over the past six years or so. And, uh, and most recently we've been working on, in addition to our client work, providing 3D visualization services, we're, we're working on building our own software plat- platform, which will be called Civil FX Vision, hopefully to be released this year, uh, maybe early next year. And then Wayne, maybe you can introduce yourself. Sure, I've been uh, doing this uh, visual simulation or <laughs> uh, visualization for almost 20, more than 20 years now. Started in 98 with uh, Louis Berger. Um, we're, and then I ended up leading the team that uh, did all the, visuals visuals for the entire company around the world did a lot of cool stuff there and then in uh, uh, 2017 I came over and uh, led led the team that uh, for civil effects yep and when we're not in a pandemic Wayne runs the office and the team for our client services all right so let's talk about visualization this is obviously a simplification but you Get CAD files, we get CAD files usually from our clients who are engineering firms or public agencies. They've done the design in something like AutoCAD Civil 3D or MicroStation inroads. Sometimes they're using open roads. We get those files, preferably they're in 3D, sometimes they're not. Sometimes we just have 2D line we work to work with. But our goal is to get them here to this the second part of the diagram, which is to get them as a 3D model. And we use something like 3ds Max. Sometimes we use Rhino and even Maya. Uh, I used to use SketchUp a lot in the past. And not only do we model them in 3D, but we want to get them textured and looking as accurate as possible. Then we get them into a real-time game engine. And in addition, we add them to the existing context, which might include the aerials and terrain and the buildings that we have artists that model those things. We place trees, we place billboards, we place traffic. We try to make it as realistic as possible. And then uh, we, the goal is to get them as some sort of image video render that they can use for public outreach or on the news 
or sometimes we've been doing interactive experiences where individuals can actually touch the touch screen, navigate themselves. We can go anywhere in the model. And this is the evolution we talked about. I think it was the third episode of the podcast. We talked about how in the past Wayne had been doing the, uh, the render farm version, but now the, the real time has gotten so good that it makes most sense to do that, especially when it comes to render times and design iterations. Simulation workflow, we get, uh, you have the input data and you take that to Im inform the simulation software of the, um, the boundaries, the variables, and then that you run the simulation. It gives you some sort of predicted results based on your input data and the other criteria that you set for, forth. And then you use that to make design decisions. So for an example, we might do, be doing a traffic simulation. So our input data would be traffic counts, which sometimes they do manually in the field, or sometimes there are sensors. Sometimes they can do traffic counts with cameras nowadays. They get all that information to kind of build an existing model. They'll use future growth of like maybe the city to say, okay, in 20 years, we expect 10% more people. And so they put all those variables into the software. They'll run it, they'll get predicted results, and then they'll use that to design the interchange, intersection, road width, whatever, maybe they'll add an additional lane or they'll use it for signal timing or whatever it is. That's, that's simulation in a typical uh, case. But there are other cases. There are structural cases. I mean, just in, just in civil, there are structural cases. There are um, geotechnical cases. There are fluid dynamics simulation software. So there, there are a lot of software tools in civil engineering and they are um, extremely valuable and, and getting better all the time in, in, using, in making decisions for design. So here are a few examples. On the left, this is a structural engineering example. On the left, you'll have something like SAP 2000, where you put in all the, um, the loads, you put in all the, you know, the design, it's gonna run the simulation, and then it's gonna say where the most stress, stresses are and you use that to identify maybe the, the beam thickness or the beam type so that they can order them to build the building. So that's simulation. And on the right, if there was a high rise, you would just, you just make a pretty picture. You just make something that conveys what the project will look like when it's finished. Another example, over on the left, we have Synchro. A lot of times traffic simulation software looks like this, especially in the past, it started to get better and use more 3D stuff. So. Uh, you just, you're running these simulations, you're seeing how bad, how bad the backups are. You want to make sure that your design works. You want to, you can add lanes and run the simulation again. You can change your signal timing, timing, run the simulation again. And, uh, traffic engineers use software like Synchro, Visim, Aimsun, CoreSim. There's a whole bunch of them. They use them all the time. And then over here on the right, you have a, uh, another diverging diamond but this is a photorealistic render. The purpose of this is to convey what it will look like. And for this sort of case, maybe you'll make some drive-through animations of the different movements and show that on the news so that the public can be familiar of what that will feel like when it's done because an interchange like this is not familiar to most, especially with, since you're driving on the left-hand side of the road. Right, so this one is a uh, floodplain simulation. Uh, here on the left, you can put in your precipitation, your 100-year flood, all these sort of criteria, you put them in and then that will allow you to make design decisions about um, pipe diameter, culvert width, uh, drainage basin depth, all these things, these decisions can be made using uh, the floodplain. And over here on the right, you see what a floodplain plane render might look like. Here on the left. That, that, might, ahead, that might be the, uh, might, from, uh, uh, the asteroid impact movie what was deep, that deep impact all right or something like that that's yeah. what it's like yep yeah i think someone just took a wave and then they did a photoshop and they did a little masking and they didn't even spend <laughs> that much time right. and then uh, another example kind of apt for our times here in 2020 is pandemic simulation this was from a um a news i think it was a washington post or something like that so they simulate all these dots or the infected people, and then you can make decisions about what happens if you, you know, do social distancing or you quarantine people. 
And then over here on the right, you have the, the ultimate pandemic visualization. This is from World War Z. So these ones two are a little tongue in cheek. Did you see World War Z? Yeah. Was that the, was that, who was in it? Was that's the, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that one. Yeah. That's one of those where it's like the whole world's falling apart and everybody's dying, but it's okay because me and my family are safe. That's this, I think this was uh, Jerusalem. They're trying to build a wall of zombie bodies to get in. So they just climb over each other like ants. Exactly. I, that was actually a cool simulation. If if you remember that movie, how yeah. everybody climbed over everyone. I mean, there's thousands, tens of thousands of these pieces in there. So that's you know a complicated simulation, actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, this brings it actually to this next diagram over here on the bottom right. We have Hollywood movies. So we, so we have this bar on the, the x-axis, photorealistic, and on the, um, the y-axis, we have smart. So what's the simulation? How, how good is the al algorithm? You, know, you were saying that simulation of the zombies over here on the bottom right, that, that's exactly what it was. And you'll see other ones, you know, like um, Lord of the Rings, they'll do simulations with like having thousands of soldiers come in. Um, they use simulation, particle simulations all the time. But the end result, they just render it out. And so it's, it's kind of dumb. Here on the bottom left, we have a hand-drawn sketch. You know, it's not realistic and it's not smart. Here on the top left, we have com computer models. You can use a supercomputer to run some sort of artificial intelligence or algorithm or whatever. And um, here on the top right, we have reality. So it's fully real and it's fully smart. We have video games, which is pushing towards reality where they're doing simulations in real time. They might be doing wind or physics simulations. They might be doing some artificial intelligence and they're getting more and more realistic. And then we have these green areas right here, civil visualization and civil simulation. So civil, civil visualization here, it's gotten more and more realistic. So it's kept moving right on this diagram and we've been trying to move it up. And that's what a lot of our case study demos are gonna show here in just a second. We want to move it up and to the right, closer and closer to reality, both in the way it looks and the way it moves. And then here on the, the left, we have civil simulation. And as I showed some of those examples, they didn't look super realistic, but they were very smart and they're very, they're very valuable. I mean, if you look at the world, you just look at a city skyline that is still standing large part um, due to these simulation software, especially anything within the last 30 years. And, uh, and so that continues to get better and um, they continue to get more and more realistic. So here's an example. Here on the left, you have Visim, which used to just be kind of dots, you know, ants running around. And over time, they've gotten better and better where they're using perspective. They're using 3D models, 3D asset libraries. You're still not quite there with realism. In this example, you're missing shadows, a lot of texture detail. Uh, maybe you don't have quite the camera abilities as some of the other software. And and let me just note that I'm not a Visim user. Maybe there are users that can do something better than this. This was just an example that I showed. And from our own experience, a lot of people that use Visim, they come to us to make their data look more realistic. And then here on the right, we have uh, a project that we did, the Centennial Bowl, and we now have smart traffic. So it does re look more realistic and there is actual simulation going on where the cars are actually avoid, avoiding each other and doing uh, merging and all that sort of thing. Have anything to add on any of that, Wayne? No, that's exactly that's exactly right. And and with the VisSim, um, yeah, it used to be like you said, uh, just a plan view. They used to only it only, would only be a plan view, and and a lot of the times the uh, the the actual plan that they're simulating on top of isn't really accurate to the design, right? So if you just know that you've got a, you've got a right turn, then it doesn't really matter what the radius is or anything else. As long as it takes the same amount of time for that car to get around and you're counting the cars and you're trying to see what it does to the traffic, you're not so concerned about the actual design. So I think that's why it started out being really rudimentary. Um, yeah, but then now uh, I, I think there are ways to make it look better if, if that's the only way you know how to do it. Um, but what we want to show is how we can actually either use that data or create our own, use our own simulation to make 
uh, a more realistic looking environment and easy to navigate. Yeah, and hopefully as both simulation approaches visualization and vice versa, the VISM users will get more serious about putting cars where they actually will be, you know, making sure the, the lane widths are exactly right, making sure the turn pockets are right, making sure the medians are there because all those things matter when we import the, the data into our stuff and it doesn't map exactly to the, the 3D design. Yep. All right, so to bridge the gap between simulation and visualization, on the left, we have simulation moving towards visualization. So back to our chart, let me go back here. This is this arrow, how do we move simulation towards visualization? Uh, you can improve the render engine, you can improve texturing. Uh, in addition to this, you can improve, you know, getting more artists involved in the process, which is something that I've learned along the way, you know, with the civil engineering background, our, our product got a lot better. The more I was able to, we were able to introduce artists that have been trained in getting lighting and texturing and um, bump maps and all these things into it. A better 3D asset library, a better animation. You know, sometimes, for example, you'll see these VISIM or these traffic simulation and the cars will kind of be jerky as they turn because again, it doesn't matter. They're just trying to make design decisions, but for visualization, that's really distractory, distracting. And then better rendering options, whether that's, you know, the ability to render various resolutions or cameras within the software, or can we get them into something better? So visualization to simulation, how can we make our visualization more smart? We have, you know, you can import simulation files. So that's what we've been able to do, which we'll show in just a second. We can import a VISM file right into um, a real-time game engine like Unity or, or um, Unreal Engine. And then you can do built-in simulation. And we've, I mentioned we've been doing smart traffic. Uh, you could do pedestrian simulations right within the game engine. Again, you know, the technology that we're using, you see this stuff all the time. You'll see a, a building crumble in a video game. That's a simulation happening in real time. It might be simplified, but we can use the same sort of thing to get some more simulation happening in our visualization environment. Um, floodplains, same thing. There are, there are a ton of water um, physics that are possible in those real-time game engines and then structural as well. These are just some of the examples. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Wayne to talk about a few of our case studies where we've been trying to move towards simulation. Okay, so what this is, this is Seward Highway. Um, this is in Anchorage, Alaska. Seward Highway kind of runs around Alaska all the way out to, to the, like the farthest west coast. Um, but the part that we, or our project area is in, right in the middle of Anchorage. Well, kind of on the south side of Anchorage, I guess. Um, and so what what we did here is this is, the existing, I'll show you that real quick first. And then we, so we modeled all the proposed and uh, the, I think Kittleman did all the simulated traffic and Jacobs did the design for, for, for this. So, but what, what's important about to show about this is the traffic. So in the proposed, condition we've actually have the visim traffic so this is the traffic that was that was simulated using visim and then we used we took the fzp file and brought it in um and then e there's data for each point whether it's a truck or a car um and then each of those points move for every frame so we, we can speed it up or slow it down because it's just it's just a kind of like just a moving point data um, file, so it's easy to manipulate. And we actually have pedestrians and bicycles in here too. Uh, but then what I want to show also is that now in the existing condition, th this traffic is our own smart traffic, so it obeys it 
simple. What we what we use is called a car following model for simulation, and it, it basically the cars are looking for um, the smoothest path, the easiest way to get through. So we we model all the pathways that they can take, and then the cars are free to change lanes. They have to stop at stoplights and signals, and then they can merge. And that's kind of a kind of harder than you would think to to be able to do. It took our developer quite a while to get just that to work. Um, but it's a pretty cool. This is really a cool design here. And here you can see the. Uh, this is a double roundabout or a, a barbell, barbell interchange. Is it a barbell or a dumbbell? Um, it's Sam? a dumbbell. A yeah. dumbbell. Uh, well, barbells and dumbbells are kind of similar. Anyway, so. Uh, and, and another thing we did, and, and on this project, we we were able to put some pathways in so that you can see how, um, let's go to scooter. So you get you give, give you an idea of which way you can go. Like this is northbound seaward to eastbound scooter. And this is, this is the pathway right here that you could take. And we bottled all these pathways in. And... So you can just click uh, and see what that movement is. Uh, and then over here, we've also done what, this red that you see, this red gradient. Uh, that's the traffic signal uh, that is turned red. So it's the signals, it's a red light. And, and we thought that was important to show just because the DDI is, like Sam said, it's pretty unique in a lot of places. and people just it just helps people understand what it is that's going on when you can see that from basically when you when you're able to see the entire interchange this entire intersection here you can't tell what the signals are red or, or green or whatever so that that was just a visual uh, help uh, in order to to understand it because really what we're trying to do is communicate the system communicate this project what it'll look like how it'll work yeah and those those stop graphics they were that's the first time that we really use them but they'll just continue to get better and be more accurate and i think that's gonna be a really helpful way to show um i mean not just stops but we could have traffic counters showing uh, or we could have density maps showing where there's more traffic and less traffic where it's slowing down where it's speeding up those visual gra graphics are they've become super important uh, part of our workflow and we hope to make them part of vision as we continue to build it. Yeah. We're just scratching the surface really. And most of the stuff that we do here is just because of our client needs, you know, we will, uh, client will be like, yeah, it would be great to be able to show this. And, and so we figure out a way to do it and then we build on it. Okay. So then the next thing that I'm going to show here, what was next now? This right here is the largest land border crossing in the United States. I won't say exactly what it is. Well, I guess it's, we can say it. It's San Ysidro Port and uh, going from Tijuana into San Diego. And th th the idea of this right here is that downstream from where these three input uh, areas are so there's three three ways for traffic to get into this system you can see right here these three right here so the, the idea here is to put actual uh, sensors in the roadway and it's it's just, it's not a coil that you know the big coil I can see at a stoplight it's a um, smaller they call it a hockey puck but it just goes a few inches underneath the asphalt can be covered up can be installed in a day and they're installed in pairs so that they can uh, count the car so it can sense a vehicle. So what we're going to do here is take that data and plug it into here. So right now we don't have that data because this is a proposal. So we've we've just hardwired in this slider so we can we can say how many cars are going into the system from each of these points. Once they get into the system, there are two variables, two other variables that affect the queue time. So this whole thing is a, is a tool for CBP or anyone else dealing with the border here to be able to figure out what the queue times are going to be for, you know, overall or for each of these different 
sections here. So that the other two variables here are the amount of lanes that are open, and we've, we've got the ability to close a lane, and then I can reset the traffic, and you'll see what that does to the queue time if you close these lanes, these security checkpoints. And then also, each of these, each of these category of checkpoints have a processing time. So it's really kind of amazing the 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 sentry lanes, which are people that are already kind of pre-screened, I guess you could say. Um, it's it, the average is 11 seconds. The the ready lanes are 30, and then the general is 58 seconds. So those are average for, and and that's just what we know are the averages. And we've got the ability to adjust it up or down a little bit, uh, just depending on if I don't know people are having a slow Monday or. People are trying to get out of the office on a Friday. Who knows? But that, those are the three, uh, the, the input volume. And that we're, we'll get that in real time, a JSON data stream right from the sensors um, server. And then uh, the other pieces of data are the amount of these security booths that are open or closed. And then the average wait time for each of them. And so once, so then we put all, you could probably just run this as a pure uh, computer simulation model, like what Sam was talking about earlier, and just if, if there was a simulation software, but there isn't really anything right now that does real-time simulation like what we're doing here. So you could put all those numbers into some algorithm and, and probably come up with something pretty close, but um, this is how it will look also and gives you the ability to, you know, alter it to change parameters yeah that's what i've been thinking about as you've been talking about this you know this i think this is our best example of getting visualization closer to simulation and seeing the value between them and uh, you know real time we talk about real-time visualization but this is real-time simulation which like you were saying is just so valuable and you may know better than i do you know does software like visim can you change things on the fly or do you kind of have to set the parameters and then run it and then see what it spits out? And then if you want to change something, you have to like set the parameters, run it again. Is, it, is there any sort of real time simulation? No. Well, I, you know, I haven't used it for a long time, maybe like five years or so, but back then, yeah, it was just set it and then go home. And when you come back in the morning that hope, hope it didn't crash and you've got all your numbers. <laughs> so it was kind of like the, the old form of, visualization like it's kind of like a render farm simulation so that's something that we should do our own research on is like how much is simulation real time and how much could integrating it into real time engines benefit from making those decisions on the fly like you're showing if you shut down two booths you can instantly see what that does rather than you know uh, putting in the parameters running the simulation seeing what it spits out yeah uh, yeah this is uh really cool and it hasn't really been done before. So we're kind of pioneering in, into this specific area. At least not that we know of. Yeah. Okay. So any questions on this one? I don't think so. That's okay. And, and you know, that one's just a demo, but if we're able to fully build it out the way we do our other models, all the buildings will look realistic. We'll be able to get the mountains in the distance traffic in the distance and, and all of that helps kind of with the immersion and the feeling that it's, it's actual realistic, um, something realistic happening. Yeah, that's, that's our proposed scope is to, and that, that also is just a very small area. We, we didn't do the entire area. So this is McCarran airport right here. And this is a large area here. So this is kind of like what, you know, the San Ysidro is, would be once we actually get that contract. So what you're seeing here is the proposed, proposed and existing. And the reason you don't see the traffic change here is because the, this was a, a visioning project. It, the, the, the difference here between proposed and existing is some of the beautification, the, um, some sign, some, some big, like this big Las Vegas sign right here. We did a couple options for it. There's even a older version that we did. 
this is one of the cool things about real time visualization is that um, we can put anything in here and you just can change it with the button. In fact, we've done that with several projects where we, we've got, a, uh, we got a, a design, we modeled the design, we, we brought it in, and then it was updated. <laughs> so we came up with a new design, and then we're like, well, we could just keep the other one in and just have a button for it, and then, you know, it, it, it's good for discussion. If you, it, when, because this is, like I said, it's a communication tool, so when it doesn't hurt to have other data in here that that uh, still it is relevant to the project even if it's not the pro what's proposed and notice down here at the bottom where it says preliminary subject to revision we put that on everything I mean that's in our template when we first start start working on any new project because uh, the, we, the it's real important that the public knows that this isn't going to probably be exactly what they're gonna see when they um, when this project is completed I mean, we could put, will be revised many times <laughs> and it'd be more accurate than subject to revision. That would too, because it will be. And, and usually, you know, we're usually on board at, you know, when preliminary design at stage or 30% design, we're hardly ever, you know, in the 90 or 100% design phase. Yeah, and, and to your point, you know, with that McCarran project showing kind of our latest iteration of our smart traffic, it's the most realistic that we've done and it's the direction we need to be going if we want to get more realistic. And as an example, we did the Reno spaghetti bowl. It's probably 18 months ago. And we did, we changed the traffic density. We had a slider where you could change the tra traffic density. And what it would basically do is randomly pick out cars um, to, to remove them and thin out the traffic. So you'd have a freeway, you'd turn down the traffic and now the traffic wasn't as bumper to bumper. And it, it was a cool gimmick and it worked, you know, if you wanted to show less or more traffic, but it wasn't realistic. But the way that this one shows it, where you have actual traffic nodes and they're spitting out more or less traffic, that's much more akin to reality. I mean, for example, that area, whenever they, whenever Air Force One comes to Las Vegas, they shut down that airport tunnel. And so you could turn that to zero to simulate what that would look like. Or maybe they have a game, maybe the Golden Knights, game just finished and so the Tropicana coming into the airport that one just bumped up a lot and so that's our current iteration of smart traffic is way better than our previous attempts yeah like I said we just iterate on top of the, the previous one so I, I'm pretty sure this system will get better and uh, it is based again on a it's car following model, which is a, a common uh, traffic simulation type uh, al algorithm. Um, and and you can see here that cars are changing lanes; they're merging. Some merging is it more graceful than other merging, but it, it like I said, we're we're always improving this. Um, but this is really pretty accurate. So when, when we plug in all of those, all those input, those inflow nodes with, with some accurate data from whatever, if you want to talk about peak AM or peak PM or off peak or whatever those, that data is, then this, is, this will give you a really good idea of what the traffic is. It's, it's not a tool that you're going to want to use to to count the traffic and ha you know that's there's still a place for visim and insan you know on that side of things on the on the simulation side but this will give you a, a good visual probably the best visual visual simulation of that of those volumes that you could get i mean the other traffic tools for visual are real rudimentary i mean we've had some big engineering firms call us and ask us if we could if we could if they could use our simulation uh uh, system so we're working on it that's the answer yeah uh, okay so then we can switch over to the next one unless you have anything else to add on this one Sam no I mean just you were saying that you still need Visim and Amson and stuff because that's where you're gonna it's gonna spit out all the data that they're gonna use for the design kit considerations but that's today in 2020 you know in 2030 hopefully everything will be a real-time game engine where it's all happening simultaneously. It looks realistic. 
and you're doing simulations that can be used for design too. Yep. This next one here is a, in uh, Las Vegas. NDOT asked us to, oh, that's the crash here. Okay. So this next one here is in Las Vegas, and this is what they're calling the ATM system. Um, what does that stand for, Sam? The I think it's um, something traffic management, autom automated traffic man management. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, the idea here, and you can see, so here's, so Andot asks us, hey, we've got this system, we're about to set it, set it live, um, but nobody really knows about it, how to use it, what it's all about, or anything, um, because it's only used whenever there's some kind of a, uh, something happens, like an accident, you know, oil spill, or somewhere, something where you need to get traffic uh, over, you need to move, you know, there's some lanes blocked, is, is what it is. So there, there was there was a, a graphic that we saw that had it looks sort of like this view where you can just see the whole system all at once. You know, we moved them, we we moved all the gantries kind of close together so you can see them all at once, and then we've got all the traffic merging here. We staged an accident, or not an accident. What what, what are we calling these? Uh, traffic collision. A crash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crash. That one's a burn. Crash and burn. Yes, it is. You can see we got some flames and smoke right here. There's a fire truck and some highway patrol cars right there. Um, but so just just uh, to explain the system here, when you come in, it, it the the far left lane is HOV, and that's probably the biggest thing about this whole system that people need to know is that these boards are dynamic that have the speed limit and the HOV lane. So if there is uh, something happening and lanes are blocked, then then the next sign is gonna say the HOV lane is open to all. So you don't get that, that what is it, three, $400 fine for driving in the HOV lane with only one occupant. So if there is something like that, that closes lanes, the system will tell you, hey, you can drive in the HOV lane without penalty. And that's what, that's what this, this sign changes to. The speed limits change to give you a little message on what's going on ahead. And then these guys here start to say, well, you got to merge out of this lane. So you can see right here, our, some traffic, our traffic is merging. And when, when our traffic goes slow, it's hard to get to merge. Like see this minivan here has just stopped and he's waiting to, for there to be enough room between these cars to be able to merge. So we're still working on, on that making that more realistic but basically then you it just keeps happening where your lanes are closed and you have to merge lane is closed you have to merge until you get around the the crash and that that's what this was all about here so it, it does have pretty smart traffic system here as far as how it the volume is set and how it merges in uh, but this is a, just a really simple uh, example of it anything to add on this one sam no i mean just it's simple now but if but we could totally make it just like that border crossing where you shut down some of those signs the traffic changes in real time and it could be a tool you could you can uh, imagine it being used by a project manager or someone on the news you know um, cnn style where they have a touch screen and they're able to automatically educate the public and show things in real time and there is value in the simulation and but there's also value just in the impressiveness of the technology you know and that these things aren't being done yet and so so putting them out there and showing them it kind of shows that you're forward thinking and you're using these tools that are becoming more and more available yeah that's how we originally envisioned this was to have it so that you can change you have some controls here to choose which lanes are going to be closed and then have the system sh stimulate that yeah yeah no that's that's great so just in conclusion you know the future as far as simulation and visualization hopefully uh, software will continue to improve so that visualization and simulation can will be happening in the same space in the same um, software platform 
And starting out, it's gonna be kind of like it is now where it's gonna be the purpose of visualization with some simulation sprinkled in or the purpose of simulation with some visualization sprinkled in. But hopefully five to 10 years from now, it will be um, visualization, visualiza like true visualization, high quality photorealistic and true simulation happening in the same software. You know, as I mentioned, we we're trying to design our own software. It's focused heavily on visualization, but as it continues to mature and grow, uh, you know, in the years coming, hopefully we'll be able to integrate more and more simulation and who knows what it could be become. And that's this multi-simulation software point. You know, right now, if you want simulation in civil engineering, you need one package for one specific thing, whether it be, you know, heck res for um, hydraulics or VISIM for traffic or, or SAP 2000 for, for structural, you know, imagine a day where all of those can take place in the same, the same 3D space. You don't have to build it multiple times. Uh, better hardware, these things, especially the visualization side, takes a lot of processing. You need a graphics card and it, it, uh, even then it doesn't always run smoothly. So as the hardware gets better, this can become easier. Better yeah, and that, Go ahead. Just to, on the hardware real quick. So that can, you know, the, the technology, especially with hardware is uh, evolving so fast. And we've seen that with VR and with the other, uh, there's also could be a game streaming where we might be able to have this, have a, a streaming system where you don't have to have a, com a, a really expensive, powerful GPU. You might be able to just stream the stream it from a, uh, from a, from a server. Yeah. And you're seeing that already, like uh, what's Google, Google Stadia. They just launched last year where you can play AAA Xbox titles on your phone because it's the process is happening somewhere else. And you can see that the application of that same technology in our space where the project manager is running our application at a public meeting, but it's just in the cloud and he's running it on his laptop or his iPad, projecting it up on the screen or that anyone could go to the project website and navigate the project like they would a video game and it doesn't matter what their device because the processing is done elsewhere uh, better teams you know hopefully the civil and the art worlds will get more and more entwined that's the purpose of this podcast that's that's kind of what we do we live in both worlds and i think there's much to be learned from from both sides you know, I think what just on, on on that topic real quick. I think the architecture firms have been doing that for a while. They're kind of a step ahead of the civil world in in um, how they have artists as part of their teams. Yeah, and visualization too. You know, they are way ahead of us in those spaces. Real time visualization, especially and to our credit, they're, prob they're solving an easier problem typically. You know, when you have a building, you're dealing with straight faces and uh, kind of a, just a limited set of parameters, whereas we could be talking about a whole city in some of our models. And so it just gets infinitely more, not infinitely, but um, exponentially more difficult to solve. So hopefully what we're doing and, you know, our, our partners and peers in the industry we're pushing civil engineering to be closer in that race with architectural as far as visualization and as you mentioned the art side too um, yeah. hopefully there will be more demand for this where, where there's more demand there's more money there's more options there's more possibilities and hopefully we'll just continue to get more and more affordable i mean you could look back wayne in your history and see you know maybe someone would spend fifty thousand dollars on an animation and you look at it now and you're just like wow you know, we could do that today for 10% of the cost or 20%. Oh, yeah, yeah. $500,000. There was some stuff that was really, uh, really expensive back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And that trend, I think, will just continue. So anyways, I, th I think this is more than just a, a niche and a side topic. I think this is hopefully um, pointing where the our industry is headed, you know, the integration of simulation and visualization. So, um, and if nothing else, hopefully everyone has a better understanding that it's not virtualization, <laughs> it's not simulation, it's visualization and simulation is very important, but it's very different too. So that's all I got. You got anything else, Wayne? No, that's pretty much it. We were, uh, um, 
trying to join those two worlds together and uh, and, and and improve the and, and so what we're mostly doing though is really about communication though you know yeah and the simulation world can't you know they can't say that they don't have communication needs as well because they do need to communicate and a lot of times they have that data right there too so but the more they're able to use their own data and their own simulation for communication in the way visualization does, the better off we will all be. So. Exactly. Like if you ever try to look and understand what's going on with the VISA model and versus when you see it, you know, running on on a road like on Seaward Highway, it's a big difference. It's a, it's a big step up and we're trying to push it even farther. Mm -hmm.